Uh, I think I'll just stay. Hi, Vale. So is it Vale or Vivale? Yeah, Vivale is fine. Vivale, cool. So I won't ask you to introduce you because even if they don't know you in person, they know it, the work that you've done for search and destroy and, and research. And can you s tell us how you started doing this kind of research? Anger. Anger. It's a great motive to do something. And I was very angry at the conventional and very scarce press coverage of the emerging punk rock counterculture, which was international. And I knew this was going to be the next big, you know, cultural inventive movement, cultural invention movement. Culture has to be imagined and invented and created. It just doesn't happen by itself. And I, but yet everyone was making such fun of it at the time, if they even bothered to cover it all. A lot of times that's the best way to help a movement, especially a so-called revolutionary counterculture movement, to start is to give it coverage and they wouldn't even cover it. So I said, I am going to cover it from the get-go, you know, with very little money. I didn't have any money, but I was working at City Lights Bookstore and the manager said, ask Allen Ginsberg. And, and he was in town for a month. This is Christmas 76. And he instantly wrote me a check for $100. I took that check to Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He wrote me a check for 100 to match it. Who, he was upstairs. And then I, another dear friend of mine who works as an MD doctor said, oh, I can pay 200 <laughs> because he made more. Yeah. And, and he was generous, and so that's, you need money to start. And, and you also try to deliver the goods. If you, someone gives you money, because these were not loans, they were gifts, you want to go, be good for your word. So you want to be sure that you produce something that tries to be kind of quality, mm -hmm. thorough, whatever the word is. Yeah, so that's how you created uh, Search and Destroy? Anger. You gotta yeah. have a motive, otherwise you don't do anything. And what, You gotta what, have a drive, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Anger is a very powerful drive. It's drives that make you do things in life. Otherwise you just coast along. Mm -hmm. So you were doc documenting the punk culture, the emerging punk culture in the Bay Area? Well, not worldwide, and I was not only documenting, I, rather I wanted to give ideas and catalyze. I wanted to provide what you call memes, but that word hadn't been invented then. Archetypes. I wanted to encourage rebellion. I wanted to encourage, because I think without, in the absence of rebellion, there is no creativity. I mean, I'm, Hegel said that in 1800 and something. And you cannot... You know, to do something original, you have to certainly, if you don't rebel, you have to be super critical of what's going on and of what they call status quo theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how long after you started Search and Destroy did you create research and try, uh, started considering your work as a research? Uh, uh, as research? Well, it was... I, it took me a long time to really get the first issue out because I had never done it. I hadn't gone to school, I had no training, and I wanted it to be kind of good quality. And it, it took months before I could get out my first issue. And, um, and I picked an easy model at the time, Andy Warhol's early interview. There had only been, I don't know, nine issues or something of interview. And I, and I, I measured with a ruler the column width and tried to do a pretty exact copy, you know, because it worked. Yeah. I mean, why? I never advise starting with a blank sheet of paper. Mm. Always copy, you know. It really helps. Find something you love and copy it. Mm. And that, you, you just cut through, you know, four years of art school training or something. <laughs> <laughs> But really, seriously. <laughs> and, and, um, So I did, we had a very tiny punk rock scene, it grew, and punk is people, it is not theory, it's humans. That's why every punk rebellion in every city was different, because the people were different. We had large numbers, I'd say the majority of people were women and gays in our early punk movement, but I'm living in San Francisco, which used to be pejoratively called the Gay Bay, <laughs> you know. 
and that's trucker slang, yeah. CB radio trucker slang, <laughs> and um, yeah, and so making it making a delivery to the gay bay today, <laughs> you know, southern accents. But but anyway, our scene was too good to last. We figured it would have two years, and it did. And then it got we got really depressed when the scene changed. It, it, people called it punk rock, but it wasn't what we called punk rock. Because we were a bunch of weirdos outsiders who were desperately seeking as much freedom as possible and as much freedom of expression as possible. And, you know, because we were like, you know, if you look at Search and Destroy, we were trying to destroy all the previous hidebound aesthetic boundaries and limitations that that we felt were just boring. Mm -hmm. I mean... And that didn't represent all of these uh, women and gay people. You know, they were we represented in, in, in any media at the time. Very few. Well, actually, you have to remember that one of my mantras is first technology, then culture. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the, the cheap, publicly accessible Xerox machine had only just been invented just before punk. Mm -hmm. You didn't have copy centers. Now there's like a bunch of copy competing copy centers, any city in America you go. But back then there was just barely one little chain called PIP, Postal Instant Press in San Francisco, and there are only a few outlets you could go. And of course all the punk rockers started to get jobs there. <laughs> and, and then they could start doing favors for their friends on the night shift. But that's because we had no money. So the know. first issues of uh, Search and Destroy, they were photocopied. No, no. I I paid big bucks to have the the printer of the local uh, small newspapers. Mm. These printing presses are as big as a warehouse. The machines are ginormous. The paper is like really wide and it comes on rolls. It's awesome to watch the printing process and binding and all that. It's so huge. It's antic. They don't. There's hardly any places left. But anyway, we we did. It's because I wanted to have a big centerfold photo. Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's luxury. Space is luxury. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a big photo in the centerfold of each issue, mm -hmm. but huge, that people could put on their wall. And so in later on in the 80s and 90s, you started documenting uh, all kind of subcultures. And well, it's all out of punk. Mm -hmm. Because punk was small and unified, and, and everybody at the beginning seemed to be some kind of artist, mm -hmm. whether they could draw or whether they took photos or whether they could write poetry, whatever. It's a very creative movement. In fact, that's what punk truly is about. It's not about anything other than being as creative as you can be, in all the, create in all the media you can. And, um, and you also, it's a powerful drive to create if you are making fun of something you hate or that makes you angry. And you have a lot of fun being satirical, you know, being ironic, just plain making fun. It's just like modifying billboards. There's so many billboards out there there used to be, and you just tweak it. You know, add a few different words, and suddenly a whole new message emerges that makes fun of capitalism's, you know, excesses. I'm not anti-capitalist by any means, because I am a capitalist. I do, I do make a small profit selling my books and zines and everything, but that's not why I do them. I don't do them to make money, that's a big difference. And I cannot figure out a post-capitalist theory yet. I'm trying really mm -hmm. hard. How can you have life after capitalism? Mm -hmm. I don't know, because we've, all, we've seen that pure communism just generates and degenerates into really cronyism. Mm -hmm. So do you consider what you do uh, political? No, no, culture. Mm -hmm. Culture is everything. I hate politics because to me, politics is all about power and gamesmanship mm -hmm. and one-upmanship, and it's about power, really. But isn't the way you create culture political? I mean, what you're going to highlight and what your, yeah, the type of people you will um, uh, show and. Well, I, let's just put it a different way. I'm, I am pretty much against the status quo of 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 societies main values, which are, you know, go to school, get a job, 
and and don't rebel mm -hmm. and and don't be creative actually mm -hmm. you know this, this the school system isn't isn't telling well you know we're teaching you how to read write and draw and take photos real early in life so you can overthrow our social value system they are not saying that but actually we don't want to totally overthrow it i think we we just want way more freedom and fun and that's not political i mean you you've put the seed of rebellion in, in, in people for 40 years. Like we were just talking with an artist that said that one of your publications really influenced her to be an, an angry woman artist uh, in the 90s. That, that, that's political, isn't it? Not to me. Not to you? It's cultural. Yeah? Okay. And so I read what pieces of the book that, or, or essay that you're working on, this uh, punk uh, philosophy. Oh, yeah. And um, to, so to you, dark humor is one of the main features of uh, that uh, punk culture? Here's why. It's so simple to understand. There is so much out there that makes you an angry, annoyed, just full of injustice. There's so much out there. There's so much injustice everywhere. There's so much to make you angry. But... If you get angry, you harm yourself, you get an ulcer. No, you have to immediately do your best to mock it, make mockery of it, do black humor, make fun of it, get a laugh, and then you can move on. Mm -hmm. And you have a higher morale too. Because I swear, everything, all the media, all the memes, everything out there are designed to make you feel worse about yourself. I'm, Punk says, no. High morale is very important, and in a society like this, you have to have as much humor as possible, and you create it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if I'm going, going back to the politics, but isn't that kind of thinking what led to that uh, libertarian movement that is very uh, Oh, I hate that. The... That's, bull that's BS. Yeah. No, it's, they sh th that's, what, that's what the conservatives are getting so good at doing. They're stealing all the language that used <laughs> to be only done by the so-called left. Mm -hmm. And I don't identify with anyone left, right. Mm -hmm. I know I'm an outsider. Yeah, but they took this rebellious uh, yeah, attitude that word and disruption. That completely changed it. Yeah, yeah. no, be... no, it, it, it's only, yeah, but if you, I say judge by deeds, not words. And if you look at what gets hap done in the last few years, the rich have gotten richer mm -hmm. and the middle class have gotten poorer. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot fewer creative, I don't know, you have to, this is why punk is so valuable, because you have to create your own job now. You have to do it yourself. You can't just say, oh, you know, I'm going to just apply for a million jobs and hope some corporation hires me. No, forget it. You've got to use the creativity inside yourself. You've got to create your own jobs. Assemble, you know, you've got to find a few people to work with, because it really helps if you have at least one person watching your back and and to bounce ideas off of because every pair of persons, you and your best friend are a think tank. Mm -hmm. When you get together, you think of ideas that neither one of you could have thought on your own. And that's what friends are for, to do projects with. No projects? Well, you better find friends you do projects with. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so, you know, this project that I'm doing is about uh, art zines, so zines made uh, by artists Good. and the relationship between zines, zine culture and the uh, contemporary art scenes, plural. And um, how, how do you consider that? Uh, no, every, I, I, say, I said zines should be made by all, and, and I think it's probably not too early in the third to fourth grades to, to start having children make zines. Whenever they can learn to write barely, and that you can already draw before you can even learn language enough to speak it and write it, but I think it's it's handy if you are able to write. I mean, remember, 200 years ago, women weren't even in schools. You know, it was only men. So many of the people were illiterate. We're talking in the world only 200 years ago. So these are all great gifts that must be shared, I think. Because mm -hmm. I think it's a much more fun world if everyone's creative. Mm -hmm. I mean, much other than what are they doing with their life? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, 
a zine is so important because the, uh, here's an important. It's not tech, the techno, technocracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technique of the zine is less important to me than the content. In other words, how slick it looks or mm -hmm. how you know it looks like a corporate ad or something. No, it can be handmade and hand drawn mm -hmm. and all that. But to me, the important factor is you one person have pretty much hundred control percent control over what ends up being the zine. Mm -hmm. And so every artist worth their salt's got to do a, a zine as a rite of passage, if not throughout the rest of your life. I, I mean, it's, it's, how do you become yourself without doing something? You know, you know I meet you and, and I ask you, what have you done? Otherwise, I don't know who you are. If you haven't done anything, I feel sorry for you. But I try to help you get in the, come on, get with the plan, make something, do something, make a zine, take pictures, you know, draw. And these are very cheap. You paper and pencil to write, make drawings, and, and can't, everyone has a cell phone, you can take, make beautiful art pictures. So is, is that how you consider your work? Like um, giving incentives to people? Hell yes, to we're act? here to inspire. The only, point of, of, I don't even like to use the word consuming media, but the only point of doing anything really is to inspire someone else to. Mm -hmm. I really think that. Yeah, to give power to To be people. creative. Mm -hmm. No, because it releases something inside you that was frustrated and dormant, but it was always there. Uh, you know, I have this motto that everyone is an artist and a scientist and people used to scoff at me and I say, no. I don't care if you've never done any art. You've certainly had dreams. Well, yes, I have. Mm -hmm. I said, in your dream, you created everything. Your subconscious did. You created the dialogue lines, so you're, therefore you're a script writer. You created the costumes on the people, therefore you're a wardrobe person. You, you did the camera work, the lighting. You designed the sets. It's all in your head. You are an artist because you had a dream. You made everything in that dream. Mm -hmm. And and they say, oh, uh, yeah, you're a filmmaker. And we all call filmmaking the king of all the arts. And then I said, everyone's a scientist because there isn't a soul on the planet that doesn't want to know how this world really works. We don't want to be bamboozled and fooled. We want to know the real deal, you know, how things work. Yeah, you're saying that everyone is a scientist, so oh, yeah. I think you didn't go to university, but you read I did it. go to university. You did? Oh, of I'm course. <laughs> but I, you, you need to go to university. Mm -hmm. I think it's very useful because I think it takes a while to figure out who, your skills and who mm -hmm. you are. And what did you study then? I studied everything. Yeah? I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but okay. then I took my first dissecting class and I said, ah, <laughs> oh, I can't do this. This is too horrific, you know. I mean, you only learn, but there are some people who would do that and love it. Mm. You don't know who you are till you do something. Mm. And, and so you read a lot, and, and there's course, a, a, the, all the a time. great deal of methodology in what you do. Can, I don't call it that. I, yeah. I do a lot of reading because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I want to know about everything unless it's really hard to read. That's why I did a book on artificial intelligence, because I didn't know what the heck it meant. And I met a genius Russian who speaks seven languages, and, and, and he did the book for me. And I said, don't dumb it down, but make it as funny as possible and make it a satire. Otherwise, no one will read it. Mm -hmm. And we put in nice, funny illustrations and try and do beautiful layout. And, you know, these are kind of games for me. How beautiful can I make something? How funny, how witty can I make something? I mean, if you don't have these goals, nothing happens. Nothing happens without goals. Nothing is accidental. And so you talk, uh, you quoted uh, Hegel uh, earlier. Who are yeah. the thinkers that uh, influenced you? Well, Hegel's huge. Mm -hmm. but, but I've read the whole history, I've tried to read the whole history of Western philosophy. The great, they called it, used to call it the great books of the Western world. I don't know okay. if you know that term, yeah. but, but you can buy them and I own them. And oh. I got them as a kid. Mm -hmm. They're hard to read. But they show you that there is a lot, there's more things under heaven and earth than you have dreamed of. <laughs> and 
I think everyone, I encourage everyone to be as curious as they can be and read as much as possible because, and don't just be content with the information you're getting on your iPhone news feeds because that's mm -hmm. BS, that is superficial. Reading takes some time and silence. Mm -hmm. So one of my mantras is silence, solitude, skepticism. That's the end of this interview. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much.